My name is Ricky Ragone. I'm the music and arts and executive pastor here at the church. A music and arts and youth pastor. Woo, that's going back saying executive pastor. My goodness. Cruise control. Chris Cajano is the executive pastor. I haven't taken his job. <laughs> he can keep it. Um, but if you have your Bibles, please make your way over to First Peter if you're not still there from our scripture reading. And as you're getting there... Um, Rather than waiting until later, I figure I'll just go ahead and start things off with a Seinfeld reference. It's only fitting. This is... So if you've ever watched the show, uh, for at least for the first few seasons, Seinfeld started off usually with Jerry and a club doing some kind of a stand-up bit. And one of the bits he did was about people's fears. And this is what he says. He says, according to most studies, or according to most studies, no, according to most studies, people's number one fear is public speaking. Number two is death. Death is number two. Does that sound right? This means to the average person, if you go to a funeral, you're better off in the casket than giving the eulogy. I always thought that was clever. But we live in a world, frankly, marked by fear. There's fear everywhere, fear of the unknown, fear of death, fear of what others think, fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of pain, fear of suffering. Only three years ago, right, the whole world experienced uh, just a new level of fear as it rippled around and everything shut down and people were getting sick and we were seeing people dying. We saw fear make people do things that we didn't even think anyone would do, like wearing hazmat suits in a car by yourself. (laughs) Like what? Fear is this, in, this emotion that seems ever increasing. We as believers have our own fears as we interact with those in the world around us. We're, we're fear of maybe hostility. We're fear of saying the wrong thing and closing a door for the opportunity to share the gospel. We're fear of being ostracized. We, whether in the church or, or outside the church, fear is real. And it's not a new thing. And that's why this morning I wanted us to turn our attention to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter, he's writing to a region of believers in the region of Asia Minor, which would be modern-day Turkey today. And uh, it's a very diverse region culturally, but at the time it was under Roman control. And under Roman rule, Christians lived in fear of coming persecution Though at the time there may not have been a formal decree saying that Christians in Asia Minor had to be uh, explicitly persecuted, they knew of what Nero was doing around other regions under Roman rule. He was a ruthless persecutor of the early church, killing believers, displaying them gruesomely for his own enjoyment. So the church throughout this region was, was worried that suffering, tremendous suffering and persecution was going to come their way. So though they weren't actively at that time being hunted down and murdered, the church was experiencing social and economic persecution by those around them where they were. Which brings about its, its own trials and its own discouragement. So in writing his letter to this church, Peter is looking to encourage the church And help them with how to navigate a difficult culture and live peaceably with those who might be against them. And where Peter points them is where I want to point us this morning as we navigate, seek to navigate a difficult culture and live peaceably with those around us. And where Peter points them is to their future hope. And that's what we're going to look at in these verses and We're going to see it broken down into hope given, hope kept, and hope lived out. So first, let's look at the hope that's given. So before Peter gets into anything regarding their circumstances, or specifically the trials that they're going to, he points them upward. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is worthy of praise first and foremost. Why is he worthy of such praise? Peter continues, right? According to his great mercy, 
He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He is worthy of praise because he is the God of their salvation. Peter's reminding them of the gospel. He's essentially saying God has shown you great mercy, calling you from hopeless to be born again to a living hope. Greater than your current problems, remember the God who has redeemed you and saved you from your greatest problem, the problem of sin. And without God's mercy and grace, all of mankind is lost and dead in sin. See, back in Genesis chapter 3, all, all of humanity is plagued by the curse of sin because of Adam and Eve's disobedience, right? They lived in paradise. They had free reign of everything that God had given them. They just had one rule to obey. Don't eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Everything else is yours. You have dominion over it. However, they allow the serpent, or Satan, right, to deceive them into eating the fruit, trusting his lies over the words of their creator. And the result of that disobedience is the curse of sin passed on from Adam to all of, all of his offspring, meaning all of mankind ever except for Jesus Christ, who was fully human, but he was different. He was fully God, and he is not from Adam's seed. And because of, every, because of sin, every human, therefore, is born, lost, without hope. Mankind was left in need of a redeemer, and redemption. That's why God had to send his one and only perfect beloved son into this world. Redemption can only be purchased through perfect, spotless, blemishless sacrifice. So Jesus was born into this world fully God, fully man, without sin. He lived in the same sinful world that Peter's audience lived in, the same sinful world that we live in, yet he remained without sin. And he willingly went to the cross to be that required atoning sacrifice to pay the debt of sin that was owed. And everyone who puts their faith and trust in Christ receives the benefit of that sacrifice. Restored relationship with God and eternal life. That's the gospel. That's what Peter's reminding them of. That's the living hope. And that happens by God's great mercy. By the power of his spirit opening our eyes to see the wickedness of our sin. Seeing our need for a savior and putting our faith and trust in Christ. But God is the one who does the work. Right? It says he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. He calls us to himself. And we respond according to his grace and mercy in faith. And our salvation moves us from being dead without hope to having a living hope, as Peter says. But it's a hope he gives us. Not a hope we can achieve on our own, right? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God and not a result of works, so that no one may boast. A hope given is a hope that is sure. It's a hope that we can be confident is. In. It's a hope rooted not in the things of man, but in our unchanging God. And it's a living hope because it's not the dead hope that the world offers. It's also a living hope because it is in a living Savior. Right? He says he's caused us to be born to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus is not in the grave. He's alive. He's ruling and reigning at the right hand of the Father. If Jesus just merely died and did not rise, we would have no living hope. We would still be left hopeless because that would mean God is not a God who keeps his word. But he did. Christ truly breathed his last on the cross, but then he also truly comes back, came back to life on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, alive. And he's ascended in heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father according to scriptures, his own very word. He kept his word. And our hope is Christ and he is alive. He is our living hope. 
Our living hope is a fixed hope. It doesn't shift. It is constant. The work of atonement is a finished work. There's nothing that can undo what Christ has done. And that makes our hope for eternity with him a sure thing, if that's where our faith lies. It's a hope that's given, but it's also a hope that is kept. Peter points them first to the one who gives them hope, and now he's assuring them that God is keeping that hope. When we put our faith in Christ, we not only receive the gift of eternal life, but we are adopted into the family of God. We are co-heirs with Christ, sons and daughters of God the Father, and we as his children have the hope of, as what we see Peter here saying, a hope of an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven. It's a, it's a birthright. It's a new birthright, right? A birthright is something that typically is predetermined to be passed down from parent to child by virtue of birth, typically to the firstborn. And our new birth, we're guaranteed that inheritance through the gospel. It's an inheritance that won't perish, that won't become defiled, that won't fade away. It's an eternal one. And it's not just waiting for us in the sense of like, okay, Christ purchased it. It's there, but... Now I have to figure out how to not lose that. God is keeping it for us. He's, he's guarding us for the ultimate revelation of our salvation. Isn't that what it says? Who by God's power are being guarded through faith. Now does that mean God only guards it by the strength of our faith? Are, are we born again of his mercy, but do we only, have, do we only keep our salvation by our own strength? No. Not at all. The God that calls us is the God that keeps us. Those whom he has called to himself who are under the blood of the Lamb and sealed with the Holy Spirit will be preserved until the end. The Spirit of God at work in believers will continue to produce faithfulness until the day they reach glory and receive the inheritance of eternal life with him forever and ever. How do we know someone has faith? There's fruit. Fruit of faith, which is the fruit of the Spirit's work, right? Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. Where the Spirit dwells, fruit is produced, and fruit continues to grow until the end. The Holy Spirit seals us until the day of redemption, Ephesians 4. He, he holds our reservation for us. I'm reminded of a family vacation we just took like two weeks ago. We were down in Delaware, we went to the beach, and the one thing that we wanted to do was go to a boardwalk and ride on like those, their surreys, like the bike with like six seats on it. Um, and so we made a reservation for one day, 9 a.m., and we show up, 9 a.m., and they don't have the bike. They're like, first come, first serve. I said, but we made a reservation. I didn't say it. Actually, Katie took over, mama bear mode. <laughs> like, oh, we're getting a bike, sir. <laughs> And I just stood back, like, holding Calvin, like, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but they didn't have the bike. Eventually it worked out. But I, I did think this is, like, a, a Seinfeld moment for sure. When, when they don't have the rental car for him in an episode, he says, you know how to take the reservation. You just don't know how to hold the reservation. And that's really the, part, the most important part of the reservation, the holding. Our God holds our reservation for our inheritance. He's a God who keeps his promises. And the inheritance awaiting those in Christ is a sure thing. Everything around us seems chaotic and unsure and unknown. We don't know what the next day holds. But this is a sure thing. This is a sure hope. So what is this inheritance? What, do, what, do, what are we eagerly awaiting what is so good that Peter points their attention here before addressing their actual fears and their trials and their strife? Whenever I try to just get a picture for, for what, what does this inheritance look like, I'm, my mind always goes to Revelation 21, this, this beautiful picture of the new heaven and new earth that await believers. Turn there if you can, Revelation 21, 1 through 7. I don't have it on the screen, but let, let this picture be 
and encouragement. Let, if, if you didn't know what hope you were looking forward to, this is a great hope. What we see is the redemption of the world in the first four verses. John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth passed away, had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. God will redeem creation. It will be restored to its original beauty. Even better but that's not even the best part. We will be able to dwell with our God, with him as it was intended. Right? The dwelling place of God is with man and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. I love that. It brings us back to how things started in the garden. God and his creation dwelling together in harmony, unashamed, full of joy. That will finally be restored I can't even fathom what that will be like, but I know it's good. The effects of sin will be eliminated, right? He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, nor mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. The former things have passed away. It's hard to imagine a world without pain and without death, without mourning or crying, because it's such a part of living under the effects of the curse. That's what's normal to us. But an inheritance waits completely void of all those things. And Peter's pointing them to their inheritance because thinking of the good things to come, thinking of the hope that is to come can make enduring the hardship of this world worthwhile. It helps combat fear and worry. Going back to that initial quote about fear from Seinfeld, I mean... Our society has a tremendous fear of death. And death is a very real fear, especially if you don't have the assurance of anything greater. And those who experience it don't get to tell you about it because it only happens once and then we don't know. So we have this, this fear of the unknown. But if we truly believe that Christ has not only saved us from our sin, but saved us to eternity with him, to an inheritance imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, then fear of death should not paralyze us. One of Apostle Paul's most profound quotes is, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. His life was so fixated on the hope that he had in Christ that his every action while alive was centered on Jesus. And he didn't fear death because he knew it would just lead him to the presence of being with Jesus. He didn't chase death, but while he was here on earth, he was going to live for Christ, knowing that under God's sovereignty, he would work all things out in his timing. So whatever time he had would be to declare and demonstrate the gospel. May that be our mindset. If you've ever been to a, a funeral here, you've probably heard Pastor Lou or myself uh, say death is not a part of life. It's not a part of life. It's a part of the curse of sin, which is why it is eliminated in the new heavens and new earth, which is why the sting of it is so deep. And it's something everyone on this side of eternity struggles with and, and has to face. And as we encounter friends and loved ones who struggle with it, we have an opportunity to share the hope of we have in Christ. The hope of what lays ahead for those who put their faith and trust in him. Not only remind them, remind ourselves of it. And again, that's not to say we don't struggle with the thought of it. It's still a scary thing. But the truth of scripture and the spirit that dwells within us can bring us to peace and give us a rest in the hope that God has given us in Christ. And just as hope influences how we work through and view death, that hope that we've been given and that is kept for us also influences how we live day by day.
day. And this is where we'll be in this third point the rest of our time. Hope lived out. Peter continues here, verses 6 through 9. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpensive and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's kind of conclude that paragraph of those verses 3 through 9. What Peter gets to is that this hope that he just laid out to should bring them to a, a, an attitude, a spirit of rejoicing in the midst of of these various trials. And he says, though now for a little while. Now we think a little while, we think, I don't know, a few days. But they didn't know how long this was going to last. But in the grand scheme of eternity, it's a little while. If you have your future hope in mind, for the rest of time, being, after we're done on this earth, for the rest of time, being in with God, then it's a little while that you're grieved by these various trials. Believers endure trials, but God continues to guard them. And though they're under extreme pressure and extreme heat, they come out not defeated, but refined. And their, their fear and their suffering, we see here, is turned to, to praise and the glory and honor at the revelation or the return of Jesus. Peter is constantly reorienting their attention from being fixated on what's wrong to being fixated on Christ. He's pointing them from, from everything around them to what is most glorious. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. You rejoice with the joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And that's where we should fix our eyes. And when we do, it changes our perspective. I think of a much younger Peter in the, the story of when he sees Jesus walking on the water. And he says, if it's you, tell me to come out. And Jesus says, come on out. And Peter starts walking and his eyes are on Christ. And he's, he takes a few steps on water. And he takes his eyes off Jesus and thinks of all the waves and the storm that's around him. And he begins to sink down into the water. If we're going to navigate through this life, the one direction we need to face is toward Christ. Keep our eyes fixed on him. But the beauty of that story of Peter sinking in the water is that it's Jesus who reaches in and pulls him out. And he does the same thing to us as he's guarding us and keeping us. And Peter continues to direct them toward Christ in some later verses and actually begins talking more about what it looks like to live out this hope. And we look at verses 13 to 16. He says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, again pointing to their hope. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. What we see here is a mental preparation, and then flowing out of that, practical living in action. Peter starts with the, with the mind because, honestly, it, an unprepared mind is far more apt to forget the hope that he's just preached to them. Right? We need to be intentional, intentional in fixing our eyes on Jesus, reminding ourselves of the gospel, reminding the mission that we've been called to as believers, that as we are going, we are to make disciples, that we are to live for his kingdom. Peter says, preparing your minds for action. In the Greek, it literally means girding up the loins of your mind. 
Back then, they wore tunics, and they had these long shirts that went with it. If they were to get ready for action, they'd hike those shirts up, tuck them into their belts so that they would be more mobile for action. He's telling them to do that with their minds. Get ready. Be ready. We are to prepare our minds for action, filling them with the things of God as we spend time in his word, right? as we spend time intentionally in prayer, as we heard about last week. And then this leads to the next thing. We're preparing our minds for action. We also need to be sober-minded. We need to have a clarity of mind. As we're going to navigate this world, we need to be clear in everything that's unclear. Peter is he's contrasting the, the mind of the believer versus the mind of someone who's using this, this picture of drunkenness. Right? Someone who's drunk is not sober-minded by definition. Their, their judgment is clouded. Their actions are erratic. They're not in control. The believer in Christ needs to fix their minds on the hope of the gospel so that they can remain clear in thought and direction. They are to conduct themselves with self-control. And that begins mentally. That begins in the, the mind and the heart and the soul before it shows itself in our actions. Something you're taught in baseball, something I was taught all through I don't know, probably from middle school on, is that, you know, if you're going to be in the field, you got to know where you're going to throw the ball before that ball is even released from the pitcher's hand. You got to know who's on the base, what the out situation is, where your force is, all that, so that when the ball does come to you, you don't have to think about where you're throwing it, you're just responding in action. The fielder who prepares his mind before the pitch is not frantic, there's not this sense of panic, but is able to make the play that needs to be played. And that's the same thing in life. We prepare our minds for action each and every day, fixing our eyes on Jesus, remembering the hope that we have before we journey out into a broken world so that we're prepared to live in a way that displays Jesus to the world around us. It allows us to not fall into the sinful behaviors in which we once walked. First the mind, then our actions. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. First Peter gives a do not. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Don't revert back to the things that you did before. Don't slip back to the sinful habits that once defined you before. God's mercy has caused you to be born again. He's called you out of that life. And note the order here, right? God calls you, obedience follows. Our obedience is the result of our calling, is a result of being born again to a living hope, is a result of that grace, not the other way around. And Peter's urging them to be obedient because God has called them out of sin and God has called them to be holy. God is holy. His children are to be holy. And holy means set apart. It means different. It means distinct. Peter's saying here that their conduct is supposed to be holy. It should look different. It's not for the purpose of superiority. Like, oh, look how good we are. Like, wow, I am holy. So holy. That's not the point. Our conduct is to be holy to point People to the God who enabled us to be even the slightest bit holy. To look different. That's what it's supposed to be for. And that's what Peter, later in chapter 2, tells the same audience here. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Not look at us and go, wow, you're so good. No, but wow, the God you serve is so good. Peter brings, brings it back to their current predicament. People treating them poorly. People speaking against them. And Peter doesn't tell them to go get in their face. Go toe to toe. He doesn't tell them to fight fire with fire. He tells them to remember, you're not home. You're sojourners. You're exiles. Your true home is that inheritance that awaits you. So abstain from the sinful passions of the flesh. Keep your conduct honorable so that they may see 
your good deeds and glorify God on the day he returns. So as, we, as we're navigating a confused world, a broken world, we, we do so with the mission, with mission in mind, to make disciples of all nations. We do that as sojourners, citizens of a greater kingdom, living for the glory of the king of that kingdom. We don't live to make everyone around us uh, in the sense, uh, live to make everyone around us love us in the sense that we conform to the world's ways to gain favor, but we also don't live with the intention to make the world around us hate us. That That can happen all on its own. We don't need to help it. We need to be intentional. Uh, something Pastor Lou has mentioned a number of times, possibly even uh, during this series, I can't remember, but like different three, three E's for how we live in the culture around us. But I think it's important, it's very pertinent to this subject and how we live as sojourners, or as Peter says in verse 1 of this book, elect exiles in this world. These are three approaches to dealing with culture. And the first approach that people could take would be to emulate culture. This would mean that we just accept and embrace what is going around us, going on around us. What the culture says is good, we just take and we receive it. We blindly receive what the world offers, not being discerning, and we aren't living holy and set apart. We're just joining and going with the flow because that will make everything much easier in the long run. But that's not what we're called to do. We can receive what is good and what is in line with Scripture, but we can't just blindly go with the flow. We want to emulate Christ, not the world. But what some do is emulate the culture. We don't want to do that. The other thing, the next one, is escape. This posture of retreating from the world, just in general. This escapism. I'm I'm going to reject everything. I'm going to hide away and become a monk and never interact with the culture. It's not blind acceptance, but it's blind rejection. You only keep to a very small Christian circle, a Christian bubble. And this would certainly be setting oneself apart, but it wouldn't be doing anything for the mission of God so that we can just declare and demonstrate the gospel and that people would see our good deeds and glorify God because we wouldn't be seen and we wouldn't be heard. We're called to live on mission, so we can't just hide away. So we don't want to emulate culture. We don't want to completely escape from the world, so what does it look like? That's the third E, engage. Don't emulate, don't escape, but rather engage the world for the cause of the gospel. And that's what Peter is calling his audience to do. That's what we see Jesus do throughout his ministry. That's what we see the apostles do throughout the book of Acts and all the letters that we see written. The only way we can point people to the hope that we have, the hope that would set us apart, is to actually engage with people. And be in the world. Not of it, right? But in it and a part of it. And so I think as we try to think through practically what's, what, are, what are some important things to remember, I just jotted down a few. And the first one that I, I just put down is don't go looking for a fight. Our minds are ready for action, but that doesn't mean that we have to stir things up just for the sake of it. Speak truth, but do it in love. Stand on the authority of the word of God but do it in a way that honors God in the process. We want to be winsome, right? We don't want to be like the Westboro Baptist Church that just goes and causes all this havoc and actually probably pushes people further from the gospel. Paul says in Romans 12, try to live peaceably with all men. So we don't want to be antagonists for Jesus. We want to be prepared, but we don't want to go looking for a fight. Second thing is declare and demonstrate the gospel of grace, not one of self-righteousness. We're not trying to go out there and boast in ourselves because we too, as Ephesians 2, 3 to 5 says, once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature chosen of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We're no better and we're no worse than anyone around us. We all come to God the same way by his grace and mercy. So we are to declare and demonstrate the gospel of grace, not self-righteousness. The other thing we need to remember is that we are not going to save anyone. 
We can do everything right. We can nail the scripture reference. We can ar- ar- articulate the gospel with perfection and precision. But at the end of the day, we're not the one who save. God does the work. We just need to be faithful to share the truth of the hope that we have when they have opportunity. But that will only happen when we have intentional, prepared minds ready for action for when the time comes. And that means in the meantime, we need to, our next thing, pray for opportunities to engage with people around us. And, and all of these things, don't, I, I'm not standing up here saying this is the list of things I do well. No, this is the thing that I need to step up in in all categories myself. But Paul says in Colossians 4, 2 and 3, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. We need to ask God to provide opportunities to share the gospel. And, and asking helps us to be mindful, to look for those situations. Look for those times where we could turn a conversation, where we could share the hope that we have. In a world where people are struggling. We can only share the hope we have if we know the hope we have. And that's the last point I have here. Preach the gospel of hope to yourself regularly. Spend time in the word, intentionally asking, how, how does this point me to Christ? We have those uh, anti fascium day cards. They, they help walk through scripture in a way that preaches the gospel, helps us think through uh, how, how the text can, can lead us to mission. We can preach the gospel to ourselves through listening to gospel-centered music that's saturated with the truth of the scripture. That can't be our primary method, but it can certainly help. And when I say gospel-centered music, I don't just mean Christian music. Because there's a lot of Christian music that you don't even know if they're singing about Christ. And it could be a love song. We don't know. It could also just be some help, self-help motivational thing that's not the gospel. Listen to songs that point us to the cross, remind us of our lostness apart from Christ and the hope we have in him. Songs that are saturated with the truth of Scripture. If you want some artists or suggestions, I'd be more than happy to share some if you need them. And I think of all the songs we were singing uh, this morning. Sometimes you don't, you don't realize how a set is going to tie into a, a text until maybe you're in that text all week like I was. And every song we're singing, I'm like, that's in the text, that's in the text. These songs that we sing, they, re, they preach the gospel to us. And then lastly, one way that we as a church together can preach the gospel to ourselves as a church family is through communion. So I'm going to actually invite the band to come up now. Communion points us to the cross. Communion it reminds us of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us in order for us to be born again to a living hope. To have an inheritance that is undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for us. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three to 26 This is what Paul says. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then verse 26, I love this. And for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Communion keeps our eyes fixed on our hope. We remember Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross, and we also anticipate the day he will return. We anticipate when all things will be made new. Where is your hope this morning? Do you, do you believe Jesus is the redeemer whose blood paid the debt of your sin? Or are you betting on yourself? That's a losing bet. Is your hope in what you can accomplish? 
It's my prayer that God would open your eyes to see your sinfulness in light of God's holiness. That you would repent, put your faith and trust in Christ this morning. Receive the hope that's given. And the hope that will be kept for those who know and love Christ. And after I pray, the band's going to play and we're going to take, uh, we're going to spend some time in quiet reflection before we take communion together. Confessing and repenting. And when you're done doing that, we'll come, we'll take the elements, bring them back to your seat. And then after that song's done, we will take the bread and the cup together. But this, this is not a King's Chapel table. This is a table for everyone who would profess and believe in Christ. But if you, if you aren't a Christian, and you're sitting here this morning, if you haven't surrendered your life to Christ, then we ask that you refrain from coming to the table and taking these elements. But I would also implore you today to make the today the day. When you turn from the hopelessness of sin to a hope of trusting and following Christ. And if that's your decision you've made today, then come to the table and celebrate what Christ has done. Celebrate the hope that is yours in Christ Jesus. May this table for all of us be a reminder of the hope that we have in an unchanging God who sent his son to redeem us. And that as we try to navigate a world full of confusion, marked with suffering, that we would keep our eyes fixed on the hope that we have to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Let's pray together. Father, the hope you offer is a hope unlike anything we know. There's much in this world that we have hope in, that there, we, we, we think there might be a chance that something could happen, but we don't know. But in you, we know that what Christ has done in giving his life on the cross for our sin, the work is finished. Victory has been achieved and eternity and inheritance with you is kept. Father, help us to see that this morning. And may the truth of that calm our souls. Bring us peace. Bring us rest. And day by day, may your spirit be at work in us, preparing our hearts and preparing our minds for action. Help us to remember that we've been born again to a living hope. And as we spend this time together before we take communion, be at work in us, keeping, showing us where we need to confess and repent. Help us to remove that, that barrier between us. Because we know that your word tells us that all who confess their sins, you are faithful and just to forgive them. Help us to confess, repent, but then celebrate the finished work of Christ and the redemption we have and the forgiveness we have in Jesus. We thank you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.